You are listening to the Amodamar podcast. In this series, Amoda explores her essential teaching through conversation and excerpts from interviews and events. To find out more about events and to sign up for her newsletter, go to www.amodamar.com. Please subscribe, comment and share if this podcast moves you. And if you feel called to donate, please go to the website. Thanks for listening and we hope you enjoy. Okay, uh, greetings one and all. Uh, my name is Kavi and I am here once again with Amoda uh, to do another podcast. Hello, Amoda. Hello, Kavi. So this is our last podcast being recorded on pretty much the... Uh, I think it's the penultimate day of this year, not New Year's Eve, but uh, the last day of uh, 2021. And I think we can all probably say it's been a pretty intense year. <laughs> and so that kind of is going to be, a, be a, a kind of loose segue into the uh, conversation today because the conversation is probably going to be called the bifurcation point of humanity um is that correct amoda that sounds about right something like that a very grandiose term so here's here's a little bit of the the context um maybe from 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 my point of view or from ours the last couple of years have seen a, some kind of intensification on a, certainly on the level of human human beings and maybe in other ways as well, maybe in terms of astrology, maybe in terms of you know, some people have been pointing out galactic changes, earth changes. Maybe these are all part of this, you know, this, this conversation. And we're not talking about science today. We're not talking about medicine. We're not talking about all these these kind of uh, very uh, I don't know what nebulous or very direct or very real or very concerning things that, that, that are being pointed at, but uh, we, we're, we're kind of talking about something else. We are talking about a, a kind of observations, I think, that have come to light or been, you know, been, been coming to the forefront over this year and last year um, that are suggesting and, and being brought by people. Uh, is, is there something happening <laughs> that's the kind of question is there something happening on planet earth in the human experience um both individually and collectively not on the political level and that kind of thing we're not experts on that we don't really have that have have that conversation in us we're talking about something else and and so i don't know you know it's a very very shambolic and loose way of of getting into this conversation so forgive me for that but um amoda you you've talked about this thing you know that that actually has stirred quite a lot of interest and you're not the only one but you have spoken about it quite a lot called the bifurcation point it's a very in in your language in a way it's a very specific or very particular um description of something that exists already is used in i think science am i right used in science yes that's where the and term originated that's where the term originated <laughs> but it's actually made it out from the frontiers of science um into actually into into spirituality yeah and so you've You've written, I know you've written some posts about it. We're not going to read those out here. This is going to be a fresh conversation. But let's 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 just start here. You you've talked about a bifurcation point. What is a bifurcation point? Mm. Let's just look at that um sort of naked nakedly out of the context of what's happening. Uh in the world right now, although it will directly relate to that. I actually wrote about this 
uh, five years ago, not predicting what was going to happen, but actually talking about a bifurcation point because it, it's it's relevant or pertinent um, in all aspects of life at all levels, from consciousness, yeah, to the material, physical reality. It's yeah. So uh, essentially, a bifurcation point. That term, I came across it uh, a long time ago when I was uh, uh, an academic, <laughs> um, a psychologist, but uh, sort of an experimental psychologist, so it was very science-based. And the term was used um, to mean precisely a point of maximum stress and it came from uh, the science of, uh, I don't know what it's actually called, but working with metals, <laughs> the point at which a metal would break, whether it's iron or whatever, the metal is gold or silver, yeah? Um, so it was research directly related with that. And the, the point of maximum stress um, I'm not sure in what context this scientific research mattered, what what it was pertaining to, but that's when I came across that term. Um, I then wrote about it in terms of uh, the psychological human condition um, when it's under stress, and stress hadn't been used in a mainstream way at that point, I mean, it's hard to imagine now because we all talk about stress all the time. It's embedded in our in our language and in our conceptual understanding. But up until then, stress wasn't really a word that made it into the everyday. And then something shifted. So that's where it came from. It then came into my field of understanding really through my own contemplation, you know, perhaps a few things that I'd picked up along the way, that there is a point of maximum stress in every system. Yeah. Um, that system could be uh, a species. <laughs> um, it could be... Uh, a social system, it could be a political system, it could be a psychological system, just the, the very sort of fabric of the of the psyche, the mental, emotional um, landscape of a human being. So you can apply it to every system, and every system has a point of maximum stress in a species that that usually comes when the population reaches a certain threshold and then the, the stress is in the balance between um, the availability of food and the need to procreate. At that point of maximum stress, one of two things can happen. The system either breaks down and say, if we're talking about a species, it becomes ex extinct or it evolves into another uh, variation or adaptation of that species. So you can apply this to any system you like. Of course, I'm interested in consciousness. <laughs> I'm into, interested in the psycho-spiritual um, uh, dynamic. Um, so when I contemplated it, this on an individual level, Again, there are many levels on an individual. There can be a breaking point on an emotional level. Yeah, so we can be simply talking emotional, mental, yeah, where the point of maximum stress, there's an internal pressure where um, feelings that have been suppressed, perhaps memories or traumas that have been suppressed, come to a head. Yeah, they, they want to burst out because everything wants to be integrated. Um, in terms of that point of maximum stress, either there's a breakdown, an emotional, mental breakdown, um, which can result in a kind of 
devolvement, either temporary or permanent. Uh, perhaps in the old days, one would be sent to a sanatorium, uh, given electric shock <laughs> treatment. Uh, I would call that a devolution. Yeah. Or there would be an evolution where the emotional, mental energies that had been suppressed come into the forefront of awareness of consciousness and with healthy, wholesome support, either from a therapist or a guide or a minister or whatever it might be, um, or by grace, that material is, that psychological material is integrated and there's an evolution of the human being, a, a personal evolution into greater maturity, greater stability, greater capacity to feel and be present. So that's on an individual level. And then we can take it to another place on an individual level, which is the tipping point, yeah, the, mac the point of maximum stress on a spiritual level. And that's when we start talking about awakening. Yeah, and Of course, we're going to relate this to, to humanity, but maybe we should just uh, kind of dig into that a little bit. Dig into... The sort of spiritual dimension, what is the bifurcation point, the tipping point that comes that gives, uh, that opens a door to the possibility of awakening? Because most, and many people do not see it in this way or do not understand it in this way. Don't see what? Awakening in this yes. way. Yes. Right. They do relate it to like the butterfly moment. The, this, is, this is a common theme, a common analogy, a common metaphor. Is is it, are, you, are we talking a meta, metaphors? Of course. <laughs> okay. So 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 is it, it, it you know is it similar to the, like the butterfly metaphor? Yes. I mean, we could say that that's a beautiful metaphor. There's a little more engagement with the process when it comes to the human being. Okay. So let's dig into this. <laughs> Because so first of all, because there's a big conversation to be had, you know, that almost defies our, our abilities to speculate about what on earth is going on with humanity as an evolutionary movement or, yeah, it's very difficult to pontificate about that, but it has to be done on a certain level at a certain point because, you know, stuff goes on with the with the organic, as you say, the same principle is true. This is what I heard you say. The same principle is true, whether it's in the individual organic body or whether it's in the, the, the human psyche or whether it's in the emotional body or whether it's in the collective, whether that collective is a, a national collective or whether that collective is a, is a whole body of whole seven billion. I mean, we had to evolve some, from somewhere. We've evolved to this point. And then to, to you know, then it, it broadens out, I guess, you know, into a, I don't know, universal or a, the whole universe is, is, is in, involved in that, 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 that um, bifurcation movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> okay. So let's break it in, break into it then. Go, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm very happy to talk about the collective. That's what we're ultimately talking about, the well, bifurcation we, we, of humanity. But let's yeah. let's backtrack and just talk about the individual on, on the level of uh, a shifting consciousness, yeah? Oh, all right then. <laughs> <laughs> all right then, that's what we're really doing here. Well, it has a to shift. be attended to because yes. the collective is made up of, of us. That's right. So it does it's the matter. same thing. That's it's why we think we don't matter, but we do matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a bifurcation point is, um, I mean, I know this from direct experience. It's, it's a point in an individual's lifetime or lifetimes, if such a thing exists, when the momentum of the egoic structure, the egoic mind, which is essentially based in a belief in 
a me, a separate entity called me, that is seeking something from other entities, <laughs> you, <laughs> him, her, them, or the world. In other words, the seeking mechanism. That is a deeply ingrained, archaic mechanism that functions as the ego mind or the ego self. That's really all that the ego is, that mechanism that has become entrenched and therefore is the driver for all human behavior, individual human behavior. Whether we see it or not, well, we don't see it to begin with. It's unconscious. That's why it's the ego mind or the ego self. It's unconscious. Yeah. It happens automatically. Um, and it's based on seeking something, seeking happiness, seeking satisfaction, seeking safety, seeking love, seeking recognition, seeking whatever it might be, fulfillment from things, material things, physical things, relationship things, people things, uh, qualification things, award things, approval things, money things, status things, and also feeling things, emotional things, and mental things. In other words, our beliefs, our thoughts, and our emotions. Yeah, we seek the good things yeah, the positive thoughts. We seek the thoughts of self-esteem, self-success, self-aggrandizement. We seek the feelings, the emotions of pleasure and safety and happiness. And yeah, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with any of these things. But when this becomes the primary unconscious driver for our actions, our behavior, yeah, and it's unconscious, then we're really running on automatic. And at some point, the exhaustion of that and the futility of that, because there is no lasting satisfaction, there is no lasting love, there is no lasting peace, uh, there is no lasting uh, worthiness or worthwhileness in the achievement of the things that we seek, in the possession of the things that we seek, in the accumulation of the things that we seek, when that is finally, uh, it comes to a tipping point. Yeah. All our striving, all our seeking, and this can is at some point applied even to the spiritual world. We start seeking the right teacher, the right guru, the right teaching that will give us what we think we want to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. And of course, that's a necessary path, yeah, the spiritual path of seeking. But at some point, even within that path, either with a teacher or without a teacher, with a teaching or without a teaching, there comes a bifurcation point. That bifurcation point is simply an internal pressure, an internal tipping point where the seeking of something outside of ourselves is seen, is felt, is known to be absolutely futile. And somehow that turns things around so that we start to examine, to see more clearly that it's the seeker, the seeker identity, which is based in me as a separate self, is the cause of the suffering. Not whether we get or don't get what we think we want. That's not the cause of suffering. That's not the cause of our unhappiness. That's not the cause of our lack of fulfillment or lack of peace. It's the very seeker itself <laughs> that is what is being called to examine, be examined. At that point, there's a possibility to stop. 
to stop the momentum. And th- what we really mean by stop is absolute presence and absolute openness right here, right now, in each moment. It's the end of future and past. It's right here, right now. And this is the beginning of awakening. So what you're <clears throat> describing is, with a, with a fancy term, bifurcation point, is actually the opportunity brought to bear by this pressure that comes from we don't know really where, whether whether it's through grace or fate or whatever, that allows an opportunity for the collapse of the self-identified seeker. To put to put, yes. put it, yeah, opportunity being the word that I'm. So it doesn't happen. What 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 I'm what I'm going to try and get to is this bifurcation point is like yes, the mechanism has has got this stresses and then it's got a, a, a an opportunity either to devolve or to evolve. Yeah, it's not a splitting of the path. It's these are def, these are very different levels of consciousness, if you will, if you like, or or of uh, evolution or whatever it is. But the opportunity involves us in what way? It requires a a vigilance and a willingness. To? To become sensitive to the inner driving mechanism. You see, many people, not everyone, of course, but many people want awakening to just happen either by the grace of a guru the shaktipat uh their reward for being on the spiritual path somehow and so on and what i'm this is this yeah this is a sort of slightly different conversation but it's the same conversation what i'm what we're coming to here in this conversation is that the point of spiritual teachings or spiritual teachers or being part of a sincere uh, path of inquiry is not to receive the blessing of the teacher, not to... uh, uh, just by merely being around the teacher to to be graced by by you know by awakening, but actually for the teacher or teaching to keep on reflecting back to the seeker where their true devotion is, because the automatic unconscious driving mechanism of seeking has a kind of devotion to it. Yeah. So when things get tough, when things get challenging or painful, there's an automatic default to that seeking mechanism to seek satisfaction or pleasure or comfort or avoidance in something. It might be a relationship, it might be food, it might be yeah, it might be the spiritual teacher itself, you know, him or herself, to seek solace in that, to seek avoidance in that, yeah, or to 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 fall into the um the pull, the unconscious pull of feeling unworthy, yeah, the unconscious patterns uh, that we call conditioning, uh, feeling unworthy, feeling not good enough, feeling unloved, feeling whatever it might be. And the point of a true teaching is to shine a light on that so that that intensity, that internal pressure can come to be seen, can come to a head. And it's only when you're finally sick and tired of that. You're sick and tired of the entity called me that is creating that, creating that I am unworthy, 
creating that I am not good enough. Mm. Yeah. And then there's a possibility. Yeah. Then the doorway, the opportunity starts to open. Okay. So how does this relate to humanity? Well, <laughs> well, um, uh, this, when, when, I, when I, with these eyes, look out at, at humanity, you know, I see this, this, I see an unconscious version in many ways of the same thing. I see a, a momentum of, of selfing writ large, writ large on, on, yeah, in the political system, in the monetary system, in the moral system, in the, yeah, in all of these, these dysfunctional, what I see as being dysfunctional, despite all the good things that we've done, you know, it's, we, we, we see a, a greed run riot. We see the, you know, just the problems that everybody with any kind of eyes who wants to see, sees those and they're not separate from the conversation actually that we're having here, which is the, the individual yeah, issue for somebody on a spiritual path who has seen the mechanism of their own greed, of their own avoidance, of their own egoic projections, of their own judgment, and has seen that it's actually heading towards where? You know, heading towards more suffering unless a, in, unless a recognition is is happens you know whether they're the doer or not doer is a moot point at this stage but so shifting this spiritual conversation from the individual that we've been talking about to the you know to the collective where does that where are we in your just in your in your eyes at the moment in yours what do you see? Well, the the consciousness is consciousness, whether it's the consciousness of an individual or collective consciousness. So the 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 nature of consciousness is the same. Yeah. So it's not going to be any different. The system, the system of an individual, of an individuation is the same as the system of a collective of, of the, of the human species. Um, and you know, the world is a reflection of of the state of humanity's consciousness. So if we're seeing a world of division and we're seeing that increasingly, if we're seeing a world of greed and corruption, and we're seeing that increasingly, if we're seeing a world of fear and panic and so on, then these are all clear reflections of the state of humanity's consciousness. Yeah, obviously there are not there are some individuals who have woken up out of this dream state, um, usually out of this egoic state. Always and usually the rarefied few and only individuals who who hold a torch for the rest of humanity, but as a as a you know as a group don't actually make much difference in that sense. Yes, the mass humanity, which is what we're looking at with the world, the mass state of consciousness is one of division, of greed, of fear, of corruption, and so on and so on. And we're also seeing a seeming breakdown of social systems, political systems, medical systems, we're seeing it as a breakdown because there's a lot of division within those systems. People on one side, people on another side, lots of narratives, lots of disagreements, lots of arguments, um, lots of confusion, lots of chaos, lots of fear, and so on. This is a breakdown of the system. Yeah, it's not functioning as a harmonious whole. Harmonious doesn't mean that we all have the same beliefs. It means that it functions for the well-being, for the 
for the wholeness, yeah, for the whole, and it's not doing that, yeah, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> and it hasn't been for a very long time. Oh, Jesus. But what's happening, what's different now is that we're seeing it, yeah? We're seeing it. It's become obvious because almost not all every human being in the world is connected through the internet. Not all. We know certain uh, <laughs> nations that are not even on the internet. Yeah. But that's Don't the rare down exception. That I won't go down <laughs> there. But as a whole, we are more connected in, 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 in terms of information. Yeah. A hundred years ago, we wouldn't know what was happening on the other side of the world. We wouldn't even know what was happening in the town you know, next to us, perhaps, yeah, um, or in the nation across the border. But now we, 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 we're all connected in that way. So we know what's going on, or we seem to know, we have some information, whether it's the truth or not the truth, a distortion of the truth, there is information, and we are connected through the internet. And so we are now seeing the extreme divide in the world between rich and poor, between haves and have-nots, between this side of the argument and that side of the argument. We're just seeing it. We're aware of it. We're in touch with it. And so this is showing us very clearly that there is a bifurcation point at this point. That bifurcation point is the pressure that is being felt on an individual and a collective level. Yeah, many people are feeling it as incredible fear, panic, confusion. That's going to be an individual bifurcation point. The possibility, and then some people are feeling a certain sense of almost anticipation, like there's something new happening here. Yeah, as the old way the old momentum of greed and corruption and seeking of, uh, uh, of power, of seeking of you know, all this stuff that goes on in the world on an individual and on a sort of national level. Um, it, some people are feeling that as a possibility for a breakthrough. Essentially, mm -hmm. a bifurcation point is a breakdown or a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. On an individual level, many people are experiencing this as a breakdown. There's a mm -hmm. rise in mental health issues. There's a rise in, rise in suicide cases uh, and so on and so on. Again, we're not going to go into that in, in terms of facts and figures, but that is going on. That's the bifurcation point on an individual level to either continue in the old egoic momentum, the old egoic mechanism of flapping around on the surface in narratives, mm. in argument, in fear, in panic, in reactivity, in violence, <clears throat> essentially, mm. in rightness and wrongness. Mm. Yeah, that's the old way. It was already in us mm. as individuals but now it's risen to the surface and it's justified because it seems to have a cause. Yeah. The cause being the worldly situation of the pandemic. Yeah. And so it's justified, but none of this is actually justified on the level of consciousness. Here is the bifurcation point. We can choose if you like, if choice is the right word, but we can. Well, it, it, there is a choice. I mean, let's another not, way. Yeah. yeah, we can choose another way. Yeah, it's not spiritual anymore. It's human. Mm. Yeah, we can we can meet what is here in a different way. Mm. Yeah, and we can talk about that. Well, yeah, I, I, yeah, they, I think on the, I, you know, in in the in the, we shouldn't actually be frightened of talking about choice. Yeah, when choice comes from a deeper place than the divided mind, I don't think we should be frightened of talking about choice because choice has got an authority in it, a choice that arises from discernment. But what I, what I heard in what you were saying was that the opportunity, you know, that, that has been carried, carried around in each of us 
<clears throat> for generations, for actually for centuries in a way, which is this this perennial that's become our reality, our collective reality, and probably has been for a very long time, of the divided self. Yeah? And the divided self writ, writ into humanity is the divided society. And what you're pointing to, and what I'm actually pointing to as well, and I believe this in a, with all my kind of visionary heart, is that it's that that's being seen. That's the dividing that's it. That, that's the bifurcation point. That's the, yes, that's the point absolutely. because everything is has been run by the divided self. The divided self in collective consciousness it allows judgment. It allows projection. It allows greed. It facilitates all of these. Yes, above and belowness. You know, it can cause suffering. It neglects. Whereas, you know, the non-divided self, if you like, they're coming home to a deeper self, which is not actually the exalted enlightened state, but is the very natural organic state of, of wholeness, doesn't, doesn't have those tendencies. That's right. So here is a great opportunity on a collective level for every individual. This is a I mean, shift in consciousness. So let's it's just okay. hang hang with hang with this, if that's a possibility. Yeah, what's the role of the individual within this? Is it something that's just going to happen on the level of the collective? Is there a role for each individual? It can't happen without the individual. The individual is the very portal. Through which, it, through, through which a shift in consciousness takes place. The waiting for a mass awakening through some galactic event, even though galactic forces do have a part to play in this, but to wait for that is the same as waiting for enlightenment by hanging around a guru yeah, or whatever it might be. Yeah, It's up to each individual. Now, that doesn't mean that every individual will awaken because some are not ready. Some are not ripe. Yeah. So there, there, there has to be a certain level of, um, I can only call it ripeness, to, to, to come to that tipping point and even begin to make that choice. You can only make that choice, if you like, when the suffering that is created to yourself by yourself from running around in fear and panic and having an argument in your head constantly comes to a point where it's untenable. You can't live like that anymore. Then there is a natural tipping point. Then you can make a choice or seeming choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not really a choice. You've, it's already been made for you, then, however, you can give your allegiance to that. And that is a kind of choice. Yes, yeah? it is. Yes, it, it is. is. Yes. Surely it is. Yes. You can choose what you devote to. Yes. You have but there has choice. to come I'll, point yeah. of, of that tipping point to be even, even be able to choose that. So there are many who are not able to do that, who are not ready. And yet there are many who are, who aren't even on a spiritual path who do have the psychological um, perhaps ripeness or maturity, but it hasn't really been fully uh, embodied or fully, um, you know, given attention to. So it is individual. We're back to conversations that have happened periodically on our podcast, which is back to the same place, which is the the spiritual seeker who's delaying or 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 casting up ahead the carrot of enlightenment, whereas the opportunity exists here and now. Yeah, I mean, on a, on a on a collective or worldly level, in what we're seeing happening now, the idea, the belief, yeah, this sort of immature, let's call it belief, that, and again, it's usually an unconscious belief, and maybe it's more conscious for some people, that there is somebody out there 
to save us, whether it's a politician, a medical expert, a government, a organization. A, maybe, it's, maybe it's somebody from the fifth dimension. It's somebody from the fifth dimension. That there is something or someone or some group <laughs> out there, some authority out there that is going to save us, fix the world, make it better, give us the solution, give us the remedy. That is the same as waiting for enlightenment from the guru. And what's happening now is the potential for every individual to be the savior, to be the light of consciousness in their own direct experience. And that's how the world evolves. I would like to ask a question about quantum entanglement. (laughs) <laughs> I would just like to ask the question about, you know, this, the, the whole reflected uh, reflection of the individual. That's holographic. Holographic. Is that what, is, yeah? Is that what is. quantum entanglement is? Yes, it oh, is. I don't really know. In, in effect, yes, right. it is. I don't really know the ins and outs of it, but that's what I see it as. What I'm, what I'm trying to get to is the power of the individual to root themselves in consciousness beyond the divided self. How powerful is that? Because once one, when one looks back through time at the mystics, at the divine beings, you know, from Jesus to Buddha to Rumi to, you know, to oh, the, these people, you see an incredible power. And not a power through the mind, but a, a deep, deep, deep power to, because they've discovered the true self. It's the only power there is. The light of consciousness is the only power there is, and it can only come through an individual. And that's where it is right now. It's like the light of consciousness is becoming available in every individual. Well, this is incredible then. It is incredible. This is an an incredible moment in time. It's the bifurcation, bifurcation point of humanity, the possibility for a radical... Uh, revolutionary shift in consciousness, whether it will take place or won't take place, whether it will take place now or in a hundred years time, whether it will be gradual or sudden, these are the same questions as the personal quest for awakening. It's the same. Yeah. So we can't predict and there's no certainty, but there is a very potent invitation in the midst of the situation that each individual finds themselves in now. Mm. And the, 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 okay. Is this, is, is, uh, you, and your invitation to those who hear your words yeah. Is stand as presence and openness in every circumstance of your experience. Yeah, whatever your circumstances, your experiences, your uh, feelings in your personal life and a personal life includes the worldly situation because that's part of our personal experience each person experiences that in their own unique way but stand in the midst of that whether things are going your way or not going your way whether things are falling away or or not yeah whether um there is change or loss or uncertainty, and especially if there is uncertainty, the potent invitation is in the midst of that uncertainty, in the midst of that intensity, in the midst of the unknownness. Remain as presence. In other words, remain as stillness inside. That doesn't mean you don't do anything, you don't take action, that you don't, yeah, but you, you, the stillness is inside. That's the end of the unconscious mechanism of the egoic self. It's the end of that. And that 
um, brings an end, a <laughs> possibility of an end to the matrix of suffering, samsara, yeah, running towards hope and running away from fear. Remain still right now in the midst of what you're experiencing. Remain open. Don't tighten. Don't shut down. You can remain open even in the midst of fear because so, fear yeah. is just a thought about the future. So it's a potent invitation so that you meet your experience. Yeah, and, and there, from, from stillness, not from flapping around in the narrative world, in the panic world, in the polarity world. You go beyond polarity. You go beyond division. Don't take a stand in yourself because you'll fall off that stand. Yeah, Something will knock you off or you'll have to defend it. Remain open, remain still and listen. Listen to your inner, your innermost. Your innermost is wiser, clearer than any narrative the mind can come up with. And then you can respond to life not react. This is the end of personal suffering. And you also stop creating suffering for those around you. And you stop adding to the division in your own life, in your own heart, in your own mind, in your relationships, and in your relationship to the world. We have to stop the division within ourselves. If anything is going to change in this world. It's a mm. problem of consciousness, not a problem of politics. Mm. It yeah. will, mm. yeah, it will radiate or filter into the fabric of our society, the fabric mm. of our politics, the fabric of our economy. It will filter into that only when there is a shift in consciousness. And that takes time. The shift in consciousness doesn't take time. Mm. It happens in an instant. It's available right here, right now. But the shift in the world, mm. in terms of structures, takes time. First, course, something yeah. has to break down. Then there has to be something new that's born from that. So we have to be patient and allow that breakdown to happen. It's like the phoenix will rise from the ashes, but first the world must burn to ashes. Mm -hmm. But it starts with you, not by going out and being an activist. It doesn't start there. It ends there. <laughs> it starts in your state of consciousness. So you, 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 the, the invitation is in your life, wherever you are. It doesn't matter where you are, what you are, what you're doing, what your circumstances are, what you have or what you haven't got. Here it is. The amazing thing is that we're all in the same situation now because the events of the last two years particularly have shown us that we'll, no matter what continent, country, with these minor deviations, we're all actually in very similar, the, the, the same boat. I hear, I hear you. I like what you said. It was very uh, beautiful and very powerful. And I, I heard it as... Um, to transcend the age of fear, because I do think that we're in the, the if the bifurcation is anything, it's the bifurcation of fear, yeah, of a, of a reality driven by fear. And we're, we're all partisan to it because it seems to play into some such a primal state of being. And if we have the capacity to transcend it, not by going outwards, but by staying rooted in the place that you're talking about, then fear itself kind of starts to come to an end. And my own personal experience of that is I have a different life when fear is not the driver. Right. Manifest manifests in a, my 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 life, the life around me, which is my direct experience, actually manifests in a very, very different way. That's right. Perhaps that is what what the quantum entanglement entanglement That's is. That's what I mean. Yeah? yeah. When we stop responding, or not responding, but reacting yeah. uh, with fear. Yeah, because yeah. fear is a is a is a biochemical has yeah. a biochemical correlate it to it, yeah? So our vibrational field has a very specific kind of uh, fragrance or frequency uh, that's called fear. Then that has an impact on our very direct reality, what 
what we experience and uh, uh, what relationships we have and what uh, comes into our lives. Yeah. And when our vibrational field is one of love and love is only born out of presence and openness. Yeah. Yes. Then reality changes. And I know that from my personal yeah. experience, I used to live a life where calamities would happen. Tragedies would happen. Problems would happen. Um, uh, things would f- be taken away. I would lose this and lose that. And I mean, big things, homes, money, this, that, and the other. Um, and, and that's cause I, I, I was in fear a lot of the time. Yeah. Yeah. It was exactly. never good enough, never worthy enough, uh, and so divided, on and so the on. The divided self. It was yeah. the divided self. Yeah. And everything has changed. I know. Yeah. Which is why many seekers believe that the awakened one, one who is uh, awakened, one who is enlightened, only has this amazing life mm-hmm. of bliss and so on. There is a truth to that. I mean, mm-hmm. it's not quite as candy floss as that, yeah, because a true awakened individual who is an authentic human being also has to interact with the world. And uh, inevitably, you pay your rent or your whatever, and you pay your bills and you fix the car and you pay your taxes. Yeah, it's just so real on. life. It's and real you're life. You're not living. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. not living in some bubble of bliss. It's not a false bliss. But there is a, a, a truth to it in that life takes on a feeling and a direct experience of goodness. Yes. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Exactly. And uh, yeah. yeah. That, so but that, and that's exactly what I, what I was talking about. Yeah? yeah, that's the quantum yeah. entanglement. That is, to me, the human version, very roughly put, of quantum entanglement. Two different realities, one dictated to by fear and the other one dictated to by the consciousness right. of love. Yeah, not the transactional love, but love as a state of the deepest state of consciousness creates a different world in the that's direct, right. in our direct vicinity, and then in the bigger, because in everything the is... That's exactly. right. Because Let's everything imagine. Everything is streaming of energy. Yes. Everything is streaming energy all of the time. And fear is a culpable, yes. it's a potent energy. Yeah. So if you, if we really, really want to change the world and enter a new world, then it's up to us as individuals to change our frequency field. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and you can't do that through fluffy new age stuff because it's just another perennial belief. Neither can you do it by fighting and, uh, yeah, more division and more violence yeah. and more so on and so on. It comes from a, an individual change in the frequency field. Whether the change that we want to see, yearn to see, long to see, feel the potential of happens in our lifetime or not, actually doesn't matter. We need to see beyond the self-serving self. Mm. It's humanity that is at stake here, not the individual. Mm. And yet it starts with the individual. Yes. Isn't that what I was actually talking about? I don't know, yesterday or something with the Bodhisattva. The Bodhisattva comes back, not because they're going to necessarily you know have have a vision of humanity you know it's a, the evolution into love but because it's the only only thing to do because faced with that choice there's only one thing to do and that's to be truth to live as truth that's right because also in awakening uh there is the fundamental recognition that there's only one being, not many mm. beings. <laughs> mm. So whether whether it's for us in our lifetime or or for you know future lifetimes, uh, generations, it doesn't actually matter because we're all mm. one mm. through okay. time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. I think we've. Uh, I think we've rambled meandered and hopefully uh, you know provoked a little um inspiration or or deepening or yeah thrown something into the pot for people uh this is and these are important conversations not just the conversations that we're having but the general conversation to actually see that uh, what's happening is you know outside in our external world is actually very connected with us and with our the capacity we have for becoming more rooted in 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 love in actual fact uh, that's certainly the invitation that i'm taking away from this um amoda is there anything you'd like to say before we 
we see this year out, actually. <laughs> what can I say? Beginning, end of one year, beginning of another year, it's all one seamless, <laughs> eternal now. <laughs> <laughs> Correct answer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, um, thank you very much for sharing your, your insight and your devotion more than anything, your, your beautiful devotion to this, this ever unfolding journey. And, um, and, uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, subscribe if you feel moved to and, uh, stay in touch and, uh, we'll be back. I think Hopefully Moda's got somebody else to talk to in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs> if not, you know, Cavie will just be back trying to do his best. Um, and I'll be back anyway for another riveting conversation with the Modemar. It's actually a joy to do this. Um, be well, take care. Happy 2022. Vive la evolution, as they say. <laughs> be well. Love to your hearts. Uh, thank you, Moda. Goodbye.